coming back to my, to my Catholic roots. That's the prayer of St. Francis. The, the current pope. I can't say our current pope. Well, I'm back. Did you miss me? Yes. I missed you. <laughs> I'm sorry that your very strong spiritual prayers did not cool Texas for me, but here we are. Another week, maybe. I hope. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Do you know who you are? The body is Christ. And what's your job description? Love God.
down here today because of the special reason. So in the first century church, um, it was the tradition of the deacon in the community who lived there to, on the, in the worship services, to come and stand in the midst of the people, so right in the middle, and to lead the prayers. And the reason for that was because the deacon lived in the community and knew the needs of the people. The presbyter or the elder would travel from place to place. So, um, I am an elder, or a presbyter, or we call them elders in the United Methodist Church, but I'm here standing where the deacon would stand because, um, as of tomorrow, my husband and I and um, my, our kiddos are going to be residents of Grand Prairie, and we're really excited about that. So, with all, um, everything going okay, the truck comes tomorrow, and the truck unloads on Wednesday, then on, I mean Tuesday, the Wednesday we go back and try to clean up the mess that we left behind. You know how that goes and me with the realtor and all that. So that's happening this week. We're really excited about that. It's our time when we go to God and, and um, offer our joys and concerns. And as we do that, I simply lift up to you that it is the summer. And um, it's hot and people are gone anywhere cooler if they have that chance, I think. Also, um, we just have a lot of people with family in town, a lot of people traveling, a lot of people to remember at this time. And uh, so remember the church um, and your financial support of our ministries because we count on each one of us, including me, to um, support the church uh, regularly with, with our gifts that help us to maintain ministries. It funds ministries and it, it um, provides our wonderful facility does a number of critical things um, and so I uh, simply lift that before you today and if you do what I do and leave your check in your purse um, and don't bring it to church like me then I just stick that in the mail or I'll stick that actually on a desk um, in the office instead so um, I invite you to do that too if, if you miss a week or so um, as we join together in prayer, I simply want to remind everyone that we are citizens of um, the body of Christ. We're citizens of a world that is in um, dark and dreary indeed, where there is war and there is famine and there are children who suffer. There are adults who suffer all over the world, including right here in the United States and in Texas and even in Grand Prairie. It's hot. There are people on the street, people who um, don't have cool places to go, um, people who lack the basic things of, of sustenance. And so when we go to God, um, we know we are called to support uh, ministries to uplift folk, but we're also called to pray for them. Now, does God already know their needs? Absolutely, God knows their needs. But there's something we understand in scripture about what happens when the people of God pray together. It's very powerful and it's different than just trusting that God knows that already, right? And I think it has something to do with the change it makes in us. But God really asks us and counts on us to lift others in prayer. And so as I pray for myself and my own family, I lift up all of you. Um, every day as well as um, persons on our, our list of joys and concerns and there's many of these uh, some new ones as well that aren't on the list yet but um, we simply want to be aware of their needs and um, invite you to remember them every day as you go to God in prayer let us join together blessed are you O Lord our God for you breathed into our nostrils a very breath or spirit of life you gifted us with the gift of life and the promise of salvation through the gift of your son jesus christ you have called us and claimed us as your own and for that we are so so grateful today as we worship oh god i'm aware of of many many needs some are here in our congregation some are needs that are far greater than um than our own area here and sometimes we, I confess to you, we get overwhelmed. There's so much need. We want to help everyone. We don't have resources to help everyone. And, and yet um, it, 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 can, it can actually make us feel paralyzed and like we can't do anything for anybody. And oh God, we know that you call each of us to be faithful in each particular way, in the way we are called. 
And so that means that we won't all be able to support everything. But you do call us, oh God, to support those causes and, and the body of Christ in general that you've lifted up before us. And for that, we give you thanks. We ask that you bless each person today, oh God, whether they are worshiping online, whether they are worshiping here in the sanctuary or in one of our other services this morning, each one. For some are grieving, oh God, there have been deaths this week. Even a new one we just learned about this morning from the Ignite community, and we want to lift up those families as they grieve. And there are illnesses, and there are injuries right now, this very week, this very day. And we lift up those in recovery, those who are healing, those who are in rehab, those who are trying to um, figure out what their new normal is in this life right now, what you call them to for the next season. Oh God, our community is in need of your love and your grace and your mercy. They need to hear your good news, and we know you count on us to be your mouthpiece now that Jesus isn't here physically. You count on us to share your love, to be your hands and feet in the midst of a troubled and hurting world and community. Now, God, we confess that sometimes we don't do a very good job of that at all. Help us to always be mindful of what we say and how we behave so that we might reflect well on you. So that we might point others to the grace and mercy you have given to us. So that others might know that true life, abundant life, life in its fullness as it is intended to be, comes through our relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. All things this day we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, today. The one who lived and died and rose again for us and the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. One of the great joys of this past week has been Vacation Bible School. We had a great Vacation Bible School. We're so grateful to those of you that sent kids and grandkids and neighbor kids and nieces and nephews and others um, who came to be with us. About half of our students were not related to the church in any way, which is fabulous. That's what we want to hear. And so today, um, I know Jamie's going to say a word and then we'll go ahead and have our children's time. You know, you have to talk really loudly or I'll have to stand really close. So, these are a couple of our volunteers. And Hi. there is one of our little lovely children. Oh, there's another volunteer. Well, you know what? If you were a volunteer, can you stand up? We've got, we've got a few. Yay! So, can we give them a big round of applause? And we wanted to say thank you so much because we had a wonderful time. And um, I'm glad y'all paid me to do this to have fun, so, yay. All right, who's it? Who's it? Let's go with Dr. Children's time. Yeah! Okay, so, hey, we have been learning the last um, couple of weeks, we've been learning the 23rd song. Do y'all remember the part from last week? Do y'all remember? I hope you do. Okay, I realized after I got home, it was going through in my head, I did make one mistake, but we will, that's okay. I didn't even have to pay yet. So here we go. So this is Psalm 23, and it goes, it starts with the Lord is my shepherd. And the way I remember it, because I have to say this song a lot. I use this at funerals, and I use it at people's at the hospital. I use it all the time. So it's really helpful if I can remember it, and this is how I do that. So everybody's invited to join with me, and I'm going to stand right here, okay? So, so you have to do the motions with me, okay? So it starts... 
the Lord is my shepherd, and you make a shepherd's crook. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's try it. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Let's lie down. Everybody lie down. Good. Lie down in green pastures. This is a part for us. He leadeth me. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Like a sunrise. He restoreth my soul. That's what we were last week. So let's do that much. Okay? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Okay, here we go. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now that's kind of hard. But you just make a little path. Okay? So he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay? And then the fun part. Yay! Is the next part. Yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shore. I will fear no evil. Okay? Yeah. So, here we go. Yay! So, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Okay. Let's see the whole thing. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yay! Though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There you go. And next week we'll pick up from there. Okay, let's have a prayer. Oh God, we thank you that you love us and that we're always safe with you. We can count on you to be with us, even when we're scared or lonely or sad or we feel left out. You always love us and include us, and we're thankful. Amen. Okay, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you are here. Reading from the book of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take him as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, fell to the ground, and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The man traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In the vision, he seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But 
But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call him his name? And hasn't he come here to take him as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite movies, one of probably my top five, for sure, is The African Queen from 1951. Anybody here know The African Queen? Okay. If you have not seen it, I urge you to go home like today and see it. Um, first of all, the sermon will make more sense. And secondly, it's just a really, really good movie. Um, Captain Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart. And um, it's in color now. And I kind of prefer the black and white version. But um, I'll take whatever I can get when it comes to the African point. It's just a wonderful movie. So in this movie, Captain Hepburn plays a Methodist missionary. And um, her name is Rose Sayer. She's gone from England, from Great Britain, to Africa with her brother, who's a Methodist pastor. And they are serving in an appointment um, as missionaries in Africa. And it's been pretty rough. Um, you're, you're giving the impression that things have not particularly gone smoothly for them. Now, this is set in World War I. And so some, some tough times hit. Um, her brother was injured and got sick then and died, so she was left by herself. And then um, a German invasion occurred, as happened um, throughout some portions of Africa at the time. And um, the village was burned, a lot of the natives were, were killed or carried off, captured, and she was left basically by herself. And it was not a good situation. So she made a decision that she was going to get out of there and go back to England, and she was going to do it by uh, way of the Ulongo River, which was considered to be inevitable all the way through. It had a point at which you just couldn't travel it anymore. Now, she is the protagonist. The antagonist in the story is Charlie Almond. And he runs a little steamboat that goes up and down the river and delivers supplies as it comes in. Now, Charlie, um, let's just say he had lived a hard life. He just had. So whereas um, it seemed like Rose focused a lot on trying to be good to people and trying to be faithful to God, and probably spent a lot of time thinking about heaven, Charlie kind of got by. And rather than having tea time in the afternoon like Rose did every day, he much preferred the gin all day long. And that was just the way he lived his life. And so he was um, just lived a, a little bit of a more worldly life than Rose did. And you could not get people too opposite uh, any more than those two. And yet uh, they encountered one another and were forced to deal with the fact that there was more to life than what they knew. Now Rose was forced to confront the fact that maybe in, in her uprightness, 
she got a little overly self-righteous, perhaps, and she forgot where real people live and how they live their lives, and that she could have fun and enjoy herself and do some other kinds of things, and but that wasn't bad. Charlie, on the other hand, was given a reminder that he might have pushed the edge a tad too much, and it was time for him to maybe rein it in a bit and to learn a little from Rose, who had a much milder temperament. Now, I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but it's so good. Please go home and watch it. Um, if you don't remember how it ends, even if you do, watch it again because I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a little um, maybe far-fetched, but that's what makes it so fun. And it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. They do get together, and by the end of the movie, they are married, which is very cool. So I will tell you that much. Um, now, what is living with AI pretty much only in heaven and disregarding herself now? The other is living with an eye on earthly things and pretty much disregarding heaven altogether. And that's the way it sometimes is. Both of these folks might be said to be living lives that were not completely fulfilling or were not completely living out what God would like to do with them in the midst of their own lives. Their quality of life was not as good as it could have been. In fact, one might even say that they were in the survival mode of their lives. I don't know about you, but I certainly go through periods where I'm in the survival mode. When I was in school, every time it would get to the finals time, I went into survival mode. I did what I had to do at church. And the rest of the time I was writing and studying just looking forward to the day the last final was turned in, you turned in your last paper, I could go to the sandwich shop, I celebrated that at the end of every semester, which was a Lamadelin. Um, back then, they weren't everywhere. And I would go there and celebrate and then um, take a break and then do it all over again the next semester. That was survival zone for me. Um, I know tax people, uh, TPAs and other accountants where March and April is their survival zone, and they are holding on by the skin of their teeth trying to get through. You know what I'm talking about? And if you're the parents of young children, wow, you've got an 18 plus year survival zone, it sometimes seems like, doesn't it? We just hold on and we go through the motions, maybe on some things, and we try our best, but we don't. We just have a sense that we're missing something. Something is not as God would have it to be. At least, that's my experience. Well, today we're talking, as we continue in the series of most important things, that God wants to give us a higher quality of life. God wants to improve the quality of our life. We've talked about God loving us and God saving us. And that was mostly God's action. But here, you might notice God wants to give us quality of life, meaning that we have to participate actively in that. We have to cooperate in that. Both Rose and Charlie in the movie fought that a little bit. They didn't, um, they would appear at the time when they just don't speak to each other, all kinds of things. But at the end, they realized that they were going to survive. If they were going to get through this victoriously, they would have to do so together. And that's true. So Paul, about whom we heard the reading this morning, and the author of a lot of the New Testament, Paul went through a time of intense change. He was converted, to use the word, literally mean turning from one direction to another, 180 degrees. He was uniquely equipped by God for a really tough mission. 
Now on the one hand, um, he started out in what is still called Saul in this passage today. He had a good Hebrew name, a good Jewish name. His mother would have been Jewish because the Jewish lineage is passed down through the mother. And he also um, was not just any educated man, he was a Pharisee, which meant that he had studied for many, many years to learn the law well enough to teach it. And we read in Philippians that he considered himself the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was like the ultimate Pharisee. He had it down. Now, you remember the groups of Pharisees that kind of grasped Jesus a little bit. Well, that would have been like Paul, except Paul never met Jesus during Jesus' earthly life. Although, he came not too long after that time. And so, um, that was his Hebrew roots. Very, very steep in Judaism. But in the midst of his being steeped in Judaism, he had gotten so focused on purity in that religious tradition that among the Jewish population, the small group called Christians, who also worshipped or acknowledged Jesus, when they began making messianic claims about Jesus of Nazareth, that was too much for some of the Jewish leaders. And even as Jesus had been arrested and tried, sort of, and crucified, so Paul was among a group of Jewish leaders who were attempting to capture Jewish people and take them back to Jerusalem before the high priest for a trial. Now, I don't know if this would have ended up in execution or not, but it could have. It was not a good situation at all. And he had a letter of authority giving him the right to do this. And so up in Jerusalem, north, he heads to Damascus. And he's got his team of, of um, bullies with him. And he is heading up to get these people, anybody that claims to be part of this group the Christians. Up he's going, and all of a sudden he is blinded by the light, literally. This huge flash of light comes, he hits the ground, he and the others around him they did not see the light, but they heard the voice, and they said, um, it, it called to him, and he said, who are you, Lord? Because he knew his human father, you see, that was the way prophets in the Old Testament responded when they were called by God. And he, he says, uh, the voice from heaven says, this is Jesus, and why are you persecuting me? Or you are persecuting me. And he was. And somehow, between the time he hit the ground and the light, after he managed to get up, realizing he was blind and couldn't see a thing, he went from being the leader of this group of bullies to being a follower as he was led into Damascus by the guys with him. Totally blind. And in the next 72 hours or so, God worked in his life in a powerful way. God had called him for something special. We read um, in this fascinating story of Ananias, who's another character that I'm not going to talk about today, but very powerfully, Ananias is, is told to go and heal Paul, Saul, so he can see. And Ananias says, um, excuse me, God, but this is a guy that was coming to get us. You want me to heal him? Are you sure? I'll do it. Just checking. And God says, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. 
And so Ananias goes. He calls Saul, brother Saul, I've been sent by God to heal you. And he heals Paul's blindness, Saul's blindness. His name changes in chapter 13. And he begins taking, not using his Hebrew name anymore, he uses his Greek name, which is Saul. And this is the other reason he was such the, so much the perfect one to have this job description from God. Because although his mother was Jewish, his father had to have been Roman. And Paul, therefore, was a Roman citizen, which gave him rights and privileges that others just didn't have, especially people who were Jews. So as he began to spread God's word, and they would try to do things to him, folks would remind the police or the soldiers or whoever it was in the town, hey, this guy's a Roman citizen, you can't. You can, you can beat him, but you can't kill him, right? There was a limit to what they could do to him because of that Roman connection. He also read and wrote Greek very well, as well as, of course, Hebrew, and he would have spoken Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. And so he had this, he was just an interesting guy. And in the 72 hours, God took him from facing this direction to facing another direction that pushed him into a whole other style of life. He thought he was on a mission, and he was, but it was not a mission to better anything. He was not part of the solution. He was on a mission initially as part of the problem. But God changed him and made him part of the solution instead. That kind of change didn't stop in Paul's time. It happens right now. And it happens today in all kinds of settings all over the world. As God works in people's lives, and they begin understanding that there's more going on here than what I can do on my own. That if they're going to live a life of meaning and purpose, they need to get out of the survival mode that they've been in and let God do what God would do. And what God does is transformation. With the biggest capital T you can imagine, God is all about transformation has been throughout the entire scripture. Old Testament, Genesis, all the way to Revelation. God is about transforming people's lives and making us better, making us different, making us more like Jesus in the way we love and treat one another and in the way we relate to ourselves. God can improve the quality of your life and wants to. But we have to cooperate. Now here's a story, just a quick reminder of a story from the book of Luke, chapter 19, about Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus in the story in the song I learned, the real little man, right? He was probably taller than me. But there you go. So Zacchaeus was a Jewish man. But he had made the decision to be a Roman tax collector among his people. So he collected taxes from Rome. Now, so the Jewish people paid temple taxes, and then they also paid Roman taxes to Caesar. Besides that, they paid a commission. I, mean, I was in sales for one very awful Christmas season many years ago when I was in college. On commission only. Uh, we're not going to do that again, I hope, for a while. Um, in fact, he upped his commission. They could have made their commission as high as they wanted. There was no limit or regulation on it. And everybody hated Zacchaeus. So when Jesus came to town and he climbed the tree, remember the song? And Jesus comes to the tree and looks up and says, Zacchaeus, 
come down. I'm going to eat with you today. The crowd went crazy. What? Somebody needs to tell Jesus, you don't eat with a man like that. He's unclean. He's going to mess up his religious um, status. <coughs> Nobody will take him seriously if he hangs out with sinners like that. But Zacchaeus took him home, and by the end of the day, Zacchaeus had become a follower. And he had said, look, I will not only be a follower, I am going to change my lifestyle. If I look back at my books and I defraud of anyone, I will pay them back with interest. Big interest. And I'm going to set my life straight. He made a good decision. Now looking over in the book of Mark 19, we see another man. This is the rich young ruler is what we call it. And this is a guy that had an incredible opportunity. Jesus actually told him, if you do these things, I want you to come and follow me. Every time in scripture Jesus said, come follow me, he was giving an invitation for someone to be a disciple, like one of the big disciples' disciples. Only this guy couldn't do it. You remember why? Because he had to sell everything he had and give the money to the poor. And then he could follow Jesus. Jesus knew he was too encumbered by his stuff, by his temporal concerns. And so he went away sadly and he made a poor choice about cooperating with what God wanted to do. The truth is that we all have that choice and we have that choice today. Every time you live in such a way that you put on Christian glasses, is what I'm going to call them, the lenses of faith that allow you to look at your life and the world through Christian eyes, and it changes your behavior, folks, you are in the process of being transformed. Every time God as you look at somebody that's like on your last nerve at work. Like I've got one last nerve and you're standing right up. Right? And anytime you look at that person and you're able to do so with compassion and think, I wonder what's going on in that person's life if he or she is behaving like that. Instead of rushing to anger or judgment or hateful speech or worse, you are making the turn. You are leaning in to where God wants you to be. You are improving the quality of your life. Every time you move out of your day-to-day -day doldrums and instead start thinking about things like what God is doing for you and with you, who can you share a word of grace with? Who can you share a word of love with? Who can you be nice to? What can you be thankful for? Anytime you think about any of those good things, you know that you are making the turn. In Philippians, we understand that we are called uh, at the very end of the book. I've got to think this through so I don't forget anything. This, um, therefore, Finally, beloved, who whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is worthy of commendability, if there is anything good, think about these things. If there is anything excellent, think about these things. And then you will learn and receive and see and hear everything you need to be faithful to me. Every time you do small things well and make small decisions well, you are leaning in to the saving work of God in your life and you are improving the quality of your life. By the end of the African Queen, the quality of life 
for Charlie and Rose is definitely better. The quantity may be limited, but the quality is definitely better. Take a look at that. Think about yourselves and think about what it would take for God to really make your life better than it is now. Because it's not all about heaven. It is about heaven, but it's not all about heaven. It's also about here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We invite um, our uh, brother um, Eric or brother Dave, one, to come up and uh, to give announcements today and to let you know some of the great things going on in the life of the church. There are so many ways to serve, and we want you to be a part of it. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. I remember that. Getting to like you. That you like me. Beginning August 1st, Pastor Marcia is setting up this called cottage meeting, just called home meetings, where she wants you to be able to come and tell her about yourself. Not in great detail, but giving her an opportunity so that she will know who you are. During this very same meeting, you will begin to, or you'll have an opportunity to learn about her. Was she born in Archer City? Was she born in Wolf City? Was she born in Level Lund or Level Land? What was the uh, livelihood of her family as she was growing up? Does she have siblings? Those would be the things that you would exchange. Now, there's a committee who will be uh, making contact with you in regard to these meetings. There's one that will occur in the morning, one that will occur in the afternoon, and then there will be evening meetings. There will be no Wednesdays or Fridays. Some of them will be conducted at homes, and some will be conducted possibly here at the church, depending on how the host situation uh, plays out. If you're willing to host one of these events, please uh, see me. Pastor Marsha, and for those of you who are viewing online, you're not here. If, if you haven't been a, a part and you want to get to know uh, our new pastor, and I think your transformation, this transition that's occurring, this is a great opportunity for you uh, to do such. Getting to know you, beginning all this first. Thanks. Thanks. Well, if I'm going to get pushed around, that's two good reasons. Um, all right, so I've got the back school blessing. You'll see in your uh, bulletin, the date is right here, August 14th. Your bulletin, it says August 7th. So Pastor Marshall will be giving our back to school blessing. Kids and anyone who works for the school district will be blessed in all morning worship services. And, um, of course, I, I fully expect that includes our uh, charter kids. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Because um, my, my kids are blessed in the charter. And, of course, we've got this. Uh, and they'll be starting a week prior. Um, so, uh, so they'll be hitting the ground running. Um, next. Let's see. I don't have it all set up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. The presentation student center in the third grade. Let's see, where are we? In here. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Going to the third grade, we'll get a Bible. If you have a child above third grade who has not received a Bible from this church, we would love to give them one. And of course, all third graders. Um, you can contact Jamie at Jamie 
at fumcgp.org. She's arranging all that, and we'll get that taken care of on, again, on the 14th. Uh, we, of course, support our, um, well, CCM is, is driving us now. Uh, help them uh, to make school brighter for providing the children in need with school supplies. We need backpacks, crayons, uh, pencils, markers, oh, uh, pencil boxes, scissors, glue, notebooks, folders, tissues, rulers, uh,
keep her worshiping with us today. Hear our benediction. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.